Kwisnesi here with Aquatoss Solutions. We've started a new video series where we're going to share our experience and knowledge related to maybe more obscure applications that our customers have maybe not seen or had exposure to. We all know that traditional Maximal has pretty limited capabilities when it comes to work control. We're allowed to create work orders, but we're not allowed to put a whole lot of control around it. And today's topic is going to be around permit to work. So it's an entire application or set of applications dedicated to controlling the permitting process when it comes to work control. So if you go into Maximo and look at from either from an HSC or an oil and gas perspective, you're going to notice that in the planning section, there's going to be a safety section. And within safety, there is permit to work, there's access permits, and there's isolation management. They're all fundamentally based on the same set of designs, but they have different levels of complexity and different use cases. So at a high level, permit to work is meant to be very comprehensive. It's detailed. There's actually control built into the application where certain things can't be completed or, or moved or done unless certain levels of approval or status have been achieved. So it's one of the unique applications in Maximo where there's actually process control built into the product. Some customers don't want that level of control, so they're looking for maybe isolation management. Isolation, the idea is that it controls the isolation component of a permit to work, but it can also stand alone and be a permit with less control and less strict structure built around it. And then access permits is even a more simplified version of permit to work, where it's really around promoting access to certain areas. Very simple in level of detail it looks for, and the level of control that needs to be defined to actually award access to certain areas. So we're going to look at it kind of from a middle ground. I'm going to look at it from the isolation management perspective. Again, it just as much detail as permit to work. The idea is it can be used for permitting. It can be used strictly to control uh, electrical isolation, but it's comprehensive enough to really do the full safe work process end to end. So let's go look at isolation management. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring up a record that I have in the database. It saves having to watch information get created from scratch. And then we can talk back from this point to see where certain things came from. So this is, as you can see, a confined space permit. Now, the idea behind permitting isolation is you can use it as a generic template for all types of permits that you want to build in the system. And the way that happens is by choosing permit to work type. So if I say this is safe work, it changes it to a safe work permit. If I say it is confined space, it changes it to confined space. If I say it is isolation only, it looks like in, in this instance, we just created the same function. So I'll keep it as a, a confined space um, permit and we'll just leave it at that. But again, it's defined uniquely. Now, you'll notice there is a templating function. This was actually a template in Maximo. So the idea here is that when you create a new permit, you can apply a template. What does that do? Well, you could pre-build your confined space permit template. So a lot of the default information, you know, maybe who the reviewers are for all confined space work, um, if it's standardized and repeatable, it could be built in. Checklist could be built in, repeatable. So anything that can be reused from permit to permit can be associated in the template, saved, and then when you create a new permit, you create it from the template. Obviously, you can come into the system and create a permit from scratch. And if you notice on this permit, if I just kind of jump ahead a bit, you'll see that it originated from a work order. So there is capability in Maximo to actually start to define permit requirements at the job plan level. So in addition to defining the tasks and labor and parts that are needed on a particular job, you can also define the permit requirements. So when that work order gets generated, you can generate the appropriate predefined permit type, again, from a template if you want to, and have it associated directly against the work order. So what do we see at the header level? When we create a new permit and isolation certificate, Maximo obviously gives it a unique number. We wanted to find what the permit is for. And again, as already mentioned, we said that this was confined space. So it uniquely identifies it as a confined space permit in the system. 
permit class, again, anytime we see lookups, they're driven by domains. So we have the ability to kind of classify this. Just gives you a way to put things into the correct bucket as far as classification. Obviously the ability to view attachments. Typically on a permit, you'll want to put in a required date. You'll want to put in a created date. That information is all typical. We'll also want to identify where that permit is being applied. So things like locations, assets, areas, unit numbers. And if we start capturing that information, there is some actual capability in the isolation certificate where we can look at simultaneous operations or common isolations. So I don't know if this one has, but let's just say it is for the boiler area. I'm not sure what this will come back with data. Yeah, I don't have enough permits in here, but it will look for other permits by status in the same area or associated with the same asset and show you those similar isolations in the same area. So it becomes valuable to put as much information as you can. You can see the activity category. This is around vessel operation. Again, really categorizing, slicing things up so that you can have the proper metrics and KPIs and reporting that's required. We're saying that this requires some specialist to come in for isolation. So the isolation component of this permit is actually gonna require the utility company to come in because of the high voltage component that we don't manage internally. I mean, we want to identify that. So there's special rules that can be defined there. We see who requested it. It could be a third party request, it could be a contractor. So it could be a company associated with it. We also identify some rules like our risk assessments required. Is there a site check required? And also who is that site checker? And you can actually set up some rules on whether people are qualified to be site checkers. So again, this starts to lean towards permit to work where some of these really strict rules, controls are baked into the product to really you know, put quotes around the entire process so there is no way to slip through the predefined approval process unless things are really following all the predefined validations. Obviously a permit can be applied to multiple locations as well. So high level permit stuff, just like anything in Maximo, the main tab is always the high level details and we start getting into the specifics as we move through the tabs. So for this particular permit, we would want to potentially identify hazards. And again, take what I'm saying subjectively. I've implemented permit to work where customers have turned off the risk assessment because they don't do it. They've turned off gas testing because they don't do it. They've turned off condition of work and they only use this tab for hazard review, which is a predefined list of questions that you want to go through before you perform work. So confined space, there's probably is the access area blocked or recovery tools within you know a certain area. You'd put those rules in there, kind of the checks that you want to make sure, standard questions that are repeatable that need to be answered every single time a confined space uh, entry permit is, is created. So they're very configurable. In this instance, I think I defined some of this, so I definitely have a risk assessment. Risk assessments can be ad hoc. I can come in here, I can go to the risk assessment tool and I can create a new risk assessment. I can predefine all my risks. I can come up with a risk ranking. Maximo would return the most significant risk. So I would have that visibility when I'm going to approve or plan this particular isolation or permit. But you can also pick through a library. So I can select values from a library if I've already got pre-built risk assessments. I've already gone through the activity of defining risk associated with confined space, I'd want to reuse that. And then of course it brings all the risks over. It tells me the severity of the risk ranking. We use a risk matrix, so it's a two or three dimensional, multi-dimensional risk matrix that looks at probability versus likelihood, looks at consequence and then um, scores it accordingly. Hazard reviews can be done. So in this instance, in order for this to be submitted, the requester has to have completed this hazard review. Did you do an assessment? Is there gonna be ground disturbance? And these are all things that are going to help the permit approver make their decision because it shows due diligence on the requester's end that they've actually answered all these questions. And it gives more insight into actually everything that's gonna be part of the this particular isolation or permit. Gas testing requirements. So we could say there is continuous gas testing required. This could come later. This could be something that the permit approver, after looking at all the validation, looking at the responses to the hazard review says, well, we do need to put gas testing in place. They can define frequency. They can even define the different tests that need to be done. So which measurements are we measuring H H2S? Are we measuring you know, ammonia levels? Gas test information can all be collected. Condition for work, we can actually define, I don't know if I've got any, no I don't, but we could say it has to be purged, it has to be isolated, it has to be fully disconnected from production systems. 
extra visibility into the condition of the asset in order to work on it. And then, of course, we get into the isolation phase, which is obviously a predominant feature of isolation management. But again, you can see that this is more than isolation management. It's the entire permit control, and one component of it is the isolation. So are all documents attached? Again, it's been submitted, it's been requested. The person actually planning the permit would go through and document that all the documents, maybe they've got as built, skated drawings, electrical, single lines that, that people need to have access to even document control on maybe from the utility side on how their disconnect is going to happen sequencing whether it's a self-isolation so i can send the permit holder out and they can actually do the isolation themselves i can define where they're going to get their lock from their lock key number lock box in use any reference drawings and then of course we get into the lock out tag out definition so in order to electrically isolate it we need to open a breaker close a breaker open a breaker in order to stop flow to that particular tank, we need to turn off a pump, we need to open an intake, we need to drain full drainage. And then of course, when we get into details on any of these, we can get very specific on the apply and remove sequence, what state it needs to be in, how we're gonna isolate it. So maybe we're using a tag or a blank or a hard disconnect. And you can see that as this progresses through, so we'll get to a certain stage where it is approved and the um, tagger is out there installing they'll actually define when the isolation was completed who completed it what lock they used they'll identify when they tested it who the authority said that you could actually test it that the test was done if there's any retests test completion and then of course the de-isolation stage where we're actually removing it who removed it when it was removed all that information is captured as part of this so you can see it gets very detailed very comprehensive Again, I've seen people take the lock out tag out and simplify it more into a tabular form where they're just checking the, the um, status or um, state of the particular asset at a point in time, open, closed, isolated, making this flow more towards maybe a predefined lock out tag out procedure that they use. All kinds of options do the configurability of Maximo. So obviously I wouldn't be doing isolations and completing all the isolations until it's been reviewed and approved. But as a planner, I want to plan the lock out tag out. And then obviously I would come back to this as a life cycle of the permit continues to progress. So who's, who's going to review it? Time date stamps. You notice there are rules and there are settings in the back end of Maximo that can control. But the hard coded rule is saying I'm logged in as me. You can see, actually you can't see, but I'm, oh yeah, right here. I'm logged in, but this is saying Andy has to review it. I can't say I'm Andy. So there is some controls in there where it's gonna validate that it's actually a authorized reviewer that's actually doing that review. The same thing goes with approval. Once it's been reviewed and approved, there's probably a checklist that needs to go through. I can say it ownership, so this will be Wilson's. The permit might be part of safety. So I can assign it to groups, I can assign it to individuals, and again, just tracking completion. You can determine as an organization, is this post-approval checklist or this checklist that needs to be done pre-approval? All that can be defined. Typically those hazards, the hazard uh, review is kind of pre and the checklists are as the, the permit is in progress. I often see this one's turned off. Uh, it really depends on the complexity of organization, this tab but um, you can do multi-site checks, you can do counter signatures, just again, depends on the complexity of your permit sign-off procedure. We also track toolbox talk. So your toolbox talk procedures, you know, your hazard checklist that you'd go through with your team before you actually start the job, your work party declaration, so who's all in there, whether they all went through the documentation, understand all safety, all hazards, and what's exactly involved in this particular job from a permitting and safety perspective, and they would all mark that they were there and signed off. You can even associate a dynamic risk review. So if the permit is in place and you see things change in expectations, maybe it's wind direction, you're outside and there's a gas plant upstream from you. Maybe you need to do some more, more review items or revalidate the requirements of this particular permit. Of course, when a permit's completed, when those isolations are completed, there is a handback stage. So was it returned to safe conditions? Were all isolations removed and verified? Inhibitors all removed, so blanks, disconnects. Isolation certificate reviewed, review date, 
on cancellation, any lessons learned or any audits that we need to do, worksite cleared, and then entry in the permit registry. So it's there for historical purposes. I'd already alluded to the fact that it could have come from a work order and you could also create other things. So maybe during the permitting process, we had an accident or something, maybe we wanna create an incident. Maybe we want to, from a permit, create a separate isolation. So we're gonna manage the isolation independent of the full permit because maybe the permit is longer term, the isolation is for a short part of time. So you can have those relationships as well. Bottom line is permit to work can be very simple or it can be very detailed, comprehensive, and even enable workflow if it gets that sophisticated in its definition. And then we've got some emergency actions. So we keep this in the background. If there is an emergency situation, we can always reference this. We know the people that we need to involve. We know the steps that we need to go through, third-party rescuers, equipment required for rescue. It's all there. It's all documented. There's no guessing. Should something go awry during the permitting process or the work we're doing related to this particular permit. And then, of course, Maxim always has logging, so work logs, any documentation, and then communications, emails that go out that are related to the, the permit. So I will stop there. Hopefully that gives you a little insight. Again, it's not meant to cover every scenario, but it's to get you thinking about the possibilities when it comes to uh, access permitting, isolation management, and permit to work within Maximo. Again, very powerful tools. We're seeing a lot of adoption and we can definitely share some more information and see how well it would fit in your particular environment. Thanks again for your time.